and welcome to Blogging Theology. Uh, today I'm thrilled to be with Hamza. Hello Hamza, Salam alaikum to you. Wa alaikum salam, thank you for having me again. Great, and we're in uh, Turkey in Istanbul at the Immersive Knowledge uh, Retreat where both of us have actually been giving uh, talks um, for several days now. Um, what, uh, have you been in, T in Turkey before Hamza? Yes, I've been here many times, many oh, times. Yeah. My, my second visit. Uh, visit. So um, I think on, on this occasion, you've been giving talks on is it strategies to deal with serious doubts, the doubts yes. there is. Yes, so I've been delivering sessions on 10 effective strategies on how to deal with shubuhat, which basically means destructive doubts. And those 10 strategies include focusing on the spiritual heart, gaining knowledge, Islamic knowledge, critical thinking, having the right environment, making the distinction between destructive doubts, valid questions and valid doubts, mm -hmm. and waswasa, which are like negative spiritual whisperings, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So we've designed it in a way to teach people how to fish, so they could you know, survive, rather than just giving them a fish, giving them an answer, because you would just feed them for a day. Wow. So as the famous, uh, is it a proverb or an adage, you know, if you give a man a fish, you feed him for a day. If you teach him how to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So there's strategies. It's not a roadmap, it's a toolkit and they could use all 10 or five, depending who they are and who they're engaging with, in order to dismantle the destructive doubts. Right. So what kind of doubts are we actually talking about? Are these well-known doubts in the in the world out there or these doubts that are particular to Muslims that Muslims perhaps don't talk about publicly so much or? Yeah, it could be anything as long as it falls within the category of a destructive doubt because the definition of a destructive doubt is that it comes from a psychological space where you attach yourself to the doubt and you now are kind of diminishing the foundations of the religion mm. and or you are trying to distort the religion like mainstream Islam for example if this destructive doubt includes that you think alcohol now is totally okay mm. and that should be promoted in society and that has become a destructive doubt to the degree where you're starting to believe in that and you want to promote it that's a, a shubha which is the singular shubhat is the plural uh, from the foundational point of view you know, you may have a destructive doubt coming from, I don't know, say new atheism and an argument or a perspective or a narrative is affecting you to the degree that you now are standing in the possibility that maybe God doesn't exist anymore. So it's really attaching them to your heart and it's affecting you. That would be a destructive doubt. But if you ask the question about I don't know a good argument for God's existence. Can you please teach me? But it comes from a psychological space where you already believe in Allah, you believe in God, you have the conviction. That's not a destructive doubt. That's like a valid question you want to learn. So we're trying to make, give people the distinction on how to make a distinction between uh, valid questions and doubts, destructive doubts, and also waswasa, which are like the spiritual whisperings. People, you know, sometimes they get OCD about things, right? But there's, obvi there's more to unpack there, but so it depends. If it falls within the definition of a shubha, a destructive doubt, then we're giving them strategies on how to deal with them. So we're not really giving them answers in particular. We may give some answers as case studies, but we're giving them strategies on how they could traverse the intellectual and spiritual path in order to deal with their doubts. We find it's more effective that way. So you, these are strategies that encompass many kind of destructive doubts. Is that what you mean? Yes, it would right. be all of them. All of them? Yes. So could you give us examples of these strategies then? So I, I've got a destructive doubt. Um, what kind of strategies can I employ to uh, you know, process that? Yeah, so there's, we've, we have 10. Mm -hmm. So one of the strategies could be actually having the right environment because sometimes the reason you have that destructive doubt because it comes from a place of I have a need to belong or I have a need to feel certain. Mm -hmm. And in social psychology, you have informational social influence or normative social influence. Informational social influence is that I have a need to feel certain about something, but I'm not getting that certainty from my subgroup, mm -hmm. the Muslims. And if that is continuous, I'm not engaging with them in that way that's giving me that certainty, I'm gonna to go to the dominant group, which is usually the kind of non-religious yeah. secular paradigm. And that's the informational social influence, the need to feel certain. The normative social influence is the need to belong. And sometimes when it's a youth or a new Muslim, they come into an environment, a Muslim environment, and they want to belong to that subgroup, their subgroup, 
yet something is happening, they're not very merciful, they don't have forbearance, or they're not opening the door to tolerance and mercy from the Islamic perspective, and it pushes them away, then they may eventually go to the dominant group. To the degree that the psychologists say that they would adopt the ideas of the dominant group, even if they don't believe in those ideas, just because they want to feel to, they have a need to belong. So based on this and other social psychological research, and also the hadith and the Quran talking about you know the importance of having right the right environment around you and so on and so forth we give them an advice that you need to actually change your environment but how, how do we do that living in the west often if you live in france for example or other places which are quite hostile in the public domain in, in the workplace in in the public square how, how do we uh, get, gain that kind of uh, structure of acceptance and affirmation which is not just going to be there usually yeah usually it's having really good friends around you and that they are people who are connected to god they're connected to the tradition and they have a sense of you know they're really committed to your well-being and that's very hard to find Paulia. Yeah. you know the prophet said in a sahih hadith narrated by bukhari in tarikh al-kabir love for humanity for what you love for yourself and the arabic is linnas the people humanity there is another famous hadith which is the hadith of the in the arba'in of a nawawi which talks about akhihi your brother but both of those traditions also mean humanity in general. Even and now we collected this hadith that mentions brotherhood. He says this means human brotherhood as well. Right. Now, from what perspective that you're committed to the goodness and guidance of all people? Mm-hmm. And this and, and now we as a classical scholar is not alone on this. There are other scholars like Ibn Taqiq Al Eid, for example, that mentions something very similar. So, what does this teach us? And this is echoing the character of the Prophet Sallam because he was a rahmah, an intense mercy to the worlds. So you're committed to someone's goodness and guidance. So the way I relate to you, the way I speak, my language, my body language should be, in an optimal sense, should be that you're feeling that I actually genuinely want good for you and I genuinely want your guidance. I think the whole person here, aren't we? We're not just looking at answers on the intellectual, informational level. 100%. But the, whole, the whole being of a human. Well, what's very interesting about the whole topic of shubuhat, destructive doubts, is that before we start the 10 strategies, we talk about what does it mean to be human? Because you're dealing with a human being, you're not dealing with an AI machine. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if we were AI machines, I can give you an abstract algorithm, a really powerful powerful, abstract, theological, philosophical argument, and I expect you to embrace Islam, but human beings aren't like that. So what we tell people is, well, the human being, as Allah created the human being, is has a ruh, has a soul, has a nafs, an ego, psychological disposition, has a fitra, an innate normative original disposition, has a qalb, a heart. And what does the heart do? It does taqallub, it wavers. And also the heart has spiritual diseases. The four main spiritual diseases is uh, kibber, arrogance, hasad, blameworthy, jealousy, riya, ostentation, and ujub, which is self-amazement. Right. And all the other spiritual diseases emanate from those spiritual diseases. Right. So the heart is diseased. Now, we also have an aql, an intellect, and the majority of the scholars said the aql is a function of the heart. Right. But the heart is wavering, and it could be diseased. Mm-hmm. So even if the aql, the intellect, has all the information about God's existence, the proof of the Qur'an, the proof of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it may not still be enough because there are other elements that we haven't with like maybe um, self-amazement, jealousy, blameworthy jealousy, vanity or whatever the case may be. Not just that, the heart with the aql is connected in some dynamic way to the fitra, the innate disposition and so on and so forth. So we need to treat the human being as the human being well, is. Holistic. Yeah, now, as a, as a 100% that's what's missing in the dawah. So take for example the concept of the fitra. There are two main opinions about the fitra. One opinion is that the innate normative disposition, fitra, fatara, fatrun, fatarahu, something's been created within us mm. to acknowledge God. So the one opinion is, which is like a Timian opinion, mm. is that we have a form of proto knowledge or primary knowledge. Yeah, sure. But because of the hadith in Sahih Muslim, which talks about that every child is born in a state of fitra, but his parents basically change him, there is a clouding, if you like, of the fitra. So our job as Muslims is to help uncloud the fitrah, to awaken the truth within which and that proton knowledge, that primary knowledge within the fitrah is to acknowledge God and to extensively praise Him. Now, and there's different ways to uncloud the fitrah. We think in the da'wah it's only this rational abstract argument. No, in many cases, and we see this in psychology, in Islamic history, how the Sahaba, the companions became Muslim, it wasn't just abstract rational arguments. Sometimes it was the character of the Prophet Wasallam and the way he related to people, which we could maybe unpack in a few moments. The other opinion is, which is maybe more of a Ghazalian opinion, 
and I think is more mainstream view is that the fitra is not doesn't have any proton knowledge or primary knowledge, but it's like a vehicle. And if the path is set, all the variables are in place, it will drive itself towards the truth. But if the windscreen is cloudy, you can't drive yourself towards the truth. So it's like an affinity, right? So again, similar thing though, that it gets clouded or it gets misty. The windscreen of the fitra gets misty and our job is to uncloud the fitra to allow the fitra, the innate disposition to drive us towards the truth. Now everyone's kind of fitra is clouded to a certain degree, right? So our job is to follow the prophetic way to engage with people in order for their fitta to be unclouded. And that's what I think is missing in the Dawah now. Engage with people, again, this holistic sense of dealing with the whole person, the human being, rather than as a recipient of just of information or uh, dealing with arguments. So it's just purely rational. It's a lot of Dawah we see perhaps at Speaker's Corner and elsewhere can be quite combative, uh, apparently uh, cerebral. Uh, we're not really respecting the whole person at all. In fact, the person's often ignored yes. just for the sake of the cameras. You know, the cameras are yeah. are filming, uh, and we want to get the we want to win. We want to be victorious over <laughs> the opponent. Um, and of course, we may win the argument, but lose the person, particularly if they're humiliated or uh, you know, treated perhaps not. I, I, no, uh, you pulled. You know what? Is, You're right. Well, I've been part of the problem too in my own journey in the Dawah. But you know, you get older and you you get humiliated yourself, and yeah. that uh, creates awakenings for you. And you develop and you connect yourself with mainstream scholars, and you just see a different. There's a paradigm shift, and I think what you're saying is extremely important. And that leadership should be taken to try and enhance and, and optimize the way we relate with other people, which is in line with the prophetic way. So the first thing I would say is, who are you in the conversation? So where is Allah in the conversation? Meaning. Who are you doing this for? Because sometimes when we engage with someone else, we have this sense of the nafs, the ego. And generally the ego always wants to be right, never wants to be wrong, always wants to look good, never wants to look bad, always wants to impose, doesn't want to be imposed upon to the degree that we give up the truth, to the degree that we give up the right way of being. And you see that sometimes. So that first has to be addressed. Who are you? And this involves the, the kind of inner spiritual reality in Islam of having ikhlas, doing it for the sake of Allah, not doing it for your ego, doing it for God's pleasure. And that means we should ask the question, what does Allah want from me in this conversation? I mean, how many people ask that question? We think, right, how am I going to beat him? That's a tertiary question. Primary is, what does Allah want me to be in this context with this person? What's closer to Allah's pleasure? And it may be many times just shutting your mouth and buying the guy a pizza because, because you would have assessed the person properly. So the ego thing needs to be addressed and have ikhlas. So you have to be sincere to yourself, sincere to others, and sincere to Allah. The second thing, which is, I think is very, very important, which is a neglected sunnah, is in the sunnah, the prophetic way of giving da'wah to individuals is to individualize them. Who is the person? What is their context? Where are they coming from? And that requires you to listen with the intention to understand. So you're not having your internal radio always playing. You're not manufacturing a response while they're talking. You're sincerely, remember what we said earlier, you want goodness for them and guidance for them. And therefore you're sincerely listening with the intention to truly understand that person because you know, if I truly understand that person, I'm more likely to uncloud their fitrah. I like it. I should say you're, you're wishing that person well. You're wanting the good for them, not victory over them, defeat yes. them, but you want their well-being, their wholeness uh, as a human being. And that's quite a, if I dare say, a kind of refreshing approach from uh, the usual. Well, this is the prophetic you know. approach, right? right. Sometimes so, the prophet. Another example on... in the prophet, upon his life, where he had this very individual approach to someone who perhaps was very hostile. To... Yeah, of course. So, for example, we have the famous example of the youth that came up to him and said that he wanted to commit zina, fornication. How did he relate to that youth? So he related with him through his body language and through his utterances in a particular way that was perfect for that youth's context. Right. And we see this in various other ahadith when it even comes to ahkam. So what will happen, sorry Hamza, what will happen with that youth? The youth, you said he wants to commit zina, which is sexual immorality. Yes. Uh, and how did the prophet... Uh, well, he basically told him to sit down and said, well, okay, what about your mother and your sister? So someone 
would usually be like maybe the first approach would be astaghfirullah <laughs> right ready to unsheath the kind of ideological sword but the way he related him was very positive another way the way the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam related to people were was when there was this arab who became muslim but nominally and he was circumambulating the kaaba and he was actually ready to kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and the prophet sallallahu kind of noticed this and said to him what are you saying to yourself or what are you whispering to yourself and then you know the arab just reacted in a kind of negative way and how did the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam respond he said ask allah ask allah to forgive you or seek allah's forgiveness and he put his hand on his chest and after that that arab basically said who now is technically a sahabi i believe he said no one after and um, the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was the most beloved person to me after this moment so there was a particular context of so the way the prophet related with his language and his body language to that person in the particular context and that context is the person who wanted to kill the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam but he transformed him just the way he expressed himself and his body language we even see this in the dawa concerning the concept of hilm so hilm like allah is al halim the forbearing yeah and we have to internalize allah's names and attributes from a human context so when allah is al mutakabbir he is like the majestically proud if you like we know the internalization of that for us is that we're nothing yeah and when allah is ar rahman the intensely merciful or al wudud the 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 loving we need to be loving from a human point of view yeah so we need to internalize god's names and attributes from a human centric point of view likewise we need to have halim in the dawa we have hilm which is like forbearance or humanity and this was a striking feature of the prophetic character so there's a famous story where one jewish man came to prophet sallallahu was quite aggressive towards him saying you owe me money and i believe it was umar ibn uh, umar ibn al khattab radiyallahu an basically said you know if if it, if it wasn't for a treaty i would have chopped your head off or something right he he was kind of aggressive how did the person respond he responded by saying umar give him the money and add more money because you frightened him right and he advised him to be polite so the way he related to the jew this person actually became muslim after and he said i was looking for the final sign of prophethood so he was looking for three signs he saw two of the signs one of the signs is repelling by that which is better and the person some would always repel by that which is better and this is and this actually leads to a beautiful two verses in the quran which i think your audiences our audiences need to know in surah fusilat chapter 41 verse 33 and verse 34 so what is allah saying verse 33 and who is better in speech than the one who calls to god does righteousness and says i am one of the muslims so we have holistic dawa here you're calling people to the oneness of god the fact that he's worthy of worship you are righteous as best as much as possible yes you're going to sin but you're on the path of returning to god you're being as righteous as possible and then you connect the righteousness to the fact that you submit to god or another tadabbur another pondering of this is I am just one of the Muslims. Yes, I'm calling people to God. I'm being righteous, but I'm like everybody else. So there's a sense of humility in the dawah, yeah. So you have a holistic approach of dawah. Not only are you calling people, you know, the abstract intellectual arguments of making the call, but you are becoming the call, mm-hmm. and you're linking your way of being to your submission to Allah. That's verse thirty-three. Listen to the verse thirty-four. Good and evil are not the same. repel by that which is better and between two people if there was any hatred it would turn to intimate friendship and this is very difficult except for the patient so interestingly interestingly the arabic word repel in this verse is not followed by a direct object it doesn't say repel evil it says repel it's like almost like an ellipsis to say repel anything by that which is better and the ulama the scholars say repelling by that which is better means repel by that which is more beautiful and repel by that which is more virtuous and between there is if there's hatred between two people who turn to intimate friendship so we should ask the question what is the most virtuous and beautiful thing to do in this context now sometimes poor it doesn't mean you're always going to be compassionate sometimes depending on the social and psychological and personal individual context you may have to give you a bit of a shake or you may have to be positively assertive mm-hmm. but in islam it's very it's like virtue ethics you have to consider the context but the the foundational approach which is in arabic aslan the foundation of dealing with people is always mercy always forbearance and we see this with musa alayhi salam moses was told by allah to go and speak to pharaoh and pharaoh was the is the, uh, an awful character he thought he was god he was a he was a zalim he was a, a an oppressor but god says 
speak to him softly, layinan, softly. Now we know it's very interesting. Imam al to be the the exegete, classical exegete. He says, you know, to the nearest effect, if Moses had to speak to Pharaoh softly, then imagine how we must speak to other people. Because if you think about it, you're not a Moses, and the person you're speaking to is not a Pharaoh. Now, don't get me wrong, when you look at the narrative of Moses and it continues with Pharaoh, Moses ups his game, if you like. He gets sometimes positively assertive. But that's when the context changes, right? And it's appropriate for the context. But in terms of foundationally, you have to have forbearance, repel everything with what is more beautiful and virtuous, be softly spoken, and also be compassionate and kind. The Prophet said that if there is compassion in something or kindness, it elevates it. If you remove compassion and kindness or something, it degrades it. So this is our way of being. We have to listen with the intention to understand. We have to, we have to come to them as, as a blank canvas. We have to have mercy for them. We have to be committed to the well-being and guidance. And you know what's significant for me as well is follow the prophetic approach of dealing with them as an individual. Yes, sorry. Very good, and very attractive, and I, I, I do, I do find that what you say is return to the, the Sunnah of the Prophet, yes. of course, which is very, very attractive, humanly speaking. But I, I won't mention names. But how do you, we deal then with certain the certain American anti-Muslim missionaries who use sarcasm and put downs, and they use their kind of intellect to uh, you know, rubbish and degrade? Yes. Um, yeah, well, we, we can be nice to them. We can treat them as individuals, and so on, but. They might just walk all over us. They might yes. they might just treat us even worse because they will see that as weakness. Although it's not weakness, it's it's being human in a very elevated way. Yes. What, what's our strategy to deal with such? I mean, I, I'm very tempted to name individuals, but I'm not going to, of course, because they're very well known on course, YouTube yeah, and elsewhere. Sure. And, I, I, and, I, and it's not a question of highlighting them as individual people. I don't mean that. I, I mean their type. Yes. This kind of harsh, uh, attacking persona which is actually quite common on YouTube and social media. So uh, how do we deal with that? Because uh, as I say, it, it could be seen as a sign of weakness yes. or, or almost submission to be nice to them, if you like. I, I agree. So I think a few questions have to be raised. Mm. What does the particular context require? So ask yourself, what is most optimal with regards to seeking Allah's pleasure? And that requires a bit of a Islamic utilitarian calculus going on. Because you have to outweigh the maslaha and the mafsada, so the benefits and the harms. So it could be the case that you have a famous Islamophobic inter interlocutor and he's being absolutely nasty. You being too soft may come across as weak and it may come across as def uh, you, that you're being defeated. So it depends what the objective is. Who is the audience? Are you now trying to deal with the non-Muslim audiences to communicate to them, the Muslim audiences or both? So depending on your objective, the way you're going to treat that person is going to slightly differ. But I do believe that you can be positively assertive yet maintain your akhlaq and your adab, your, your, your good character. You can be positively assertive. You can hold people to account within the framework of the Islamic tradition. So yes, when we say the foundational thing is to be soft and nice and compassionate, we're not saying everyone should be treated that way. No. We're saying it's virtue ethics. What is the kind of individual moral variables going on in line with your objective? Because sometimes when we react to someone very harshly, it might be okay to do ethically and spiritually, but we may have not fulfilled the objective because our objective was both audiences. Mm -hmm. So maybe we should have kept that in mind that there is a maslaha, there is a benefit that's outweighing a particular harm that we've missed out. But that all requires a particular context and a chess playing. And in my advice with Du'at and Mashayikh and speakers who are in the debating arena, they have to do shura. They have to consult with others yes. because consultation is a key prophetic practice. <coughs> you have to consult with others in order to understand that you may have some blind spots and they could unveil them for you to think, oh yeah, that's actually a good point. Maybe I was too harsh there. Also to be aware of the strategies of the, the enemy, in inverted commas, if that person is perceived as an enemy because they're very attacking all the time. Yes. So, so, you know, be aware of the strategies of this person, the kind of thing they're likely to mention, rather than just innocently go in there, lamb to the slaughter. So, yeah, there, there is the sure of the consultation. Absolutely. Yeah, so I know this is not a direct answer, but I think it's more powerful to give people those type of questions and that type of 
ethic, if you like, so they could come to the right conclusion. Do shura, understand the moral variables, understand the context, understand what your main objective is, understand the maslaha and mafsada, the benefits and the harms of being in a, uh, being a particular way, uh, approaching it or approaching the person a particular way, understand what's going on here. So sometimes you may have just one objective in mind, which is I want to show that Muslims are not weak and I want to give confidence to the Muslims, which is good. But should that be only the only objective? You may have to balance objectives here. There may be another objective, which is, well, I have a non-Muslim audience that I want to reach out to as well. So you may have to slightly tweak your strategy. But if you have this conversation like we're having right now, then it's the beginning of success. And unfortunately, people don't have, many people don't have this discussion. They're just ready to go. And they have one objective in mind. And they don't see the bigger picture. Or they don't even ask, what is more pleasing to Allah? In, in light of the kind of wider dawah context. Because we live in a, we don't live in an, in an arena anymore where you can have a debate with a thousand people and there are a particular audience with a particular disposition and it's not going to get recorded. Now, everything's online, everything is available. So we now have to balance so many different objectives and so many different audiences. And I know it's much more difficult, but if we start this type of conversation, we'll do something that's more pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, you know, coming to the point of, you know, the prophetic dawah and individualizing the dawah, I think it's very important as well to, you know, I, I we were doing this in the course actually. So I try to get people to make a distinction between their drama and reality. Yeah. So your drama or my drama, our drama is our limited experiences, ideas, perspectives, concepts, and all of that stuff. And we use that as a lens in order to interpret ourselves and reality. And I trying to get people to stand in the possibility that your drama is not always your reality, the reality. For example, in a Dao context, John comes up to you. John is an atheist. So for many people, when John says, hi, my name is John. I want to speak to you about Islam. I'm an atheist. So what happens to you? Usually what happens is you take your drama, meaning your limited ideas, perspectives, experiences, etc., of what you think it means to be an atheist. And in this context, it may be he's a Dawkins fan. He loves science. Um, you know, he is immoral yeah, or amoral, all of that stuff. And you use that as your lens mm -hmm. to engage with John. So I ask people, truly, who are you engaging with? Are you engaging with John or your drama about John? Well, you're engaging with your drama about John. You're not really engaging with John himself. So the art of the prophetic Tao is to individualize the person, be a blank canvas and find out who that person really is. And I see this so a lot in conversations. They're talking past each other. I mean, this, this is so true. The example you give is, is a very good one. I remember reading recently, there was a, an academic survey done, I think the five universities uh, cobbled together and looked at what atheists actually believe globally. So they went to Japan, Finland, Europe, South America, whatever. And they, they discovered that the majority of self-described, self-designated atheists actually believed in the supernatural. Oh. That, that, that may be uh, um, life after death, they may believe in angels, they may believe in whatever, wow. but they don't believe in God. And well, why that really shocked me, you mentioned Richard Dawkins, of course he's the archetypal atheist, but he is a hardcore materialist mm. who doesn't believe in anything other than scientific uh, verifiable empirical reality. Yes. But that doesn't seem to represent the majority of self-designated atheists. And why that matters, of course, is now whenever I meet an atheist, I don't assume they're like Dawkins, mm -hmm. that they have that kind of car-carrying, hard-called scientific materialist worldview. Because chances are they won't actually, um, statistically anyway, in terms of the global survey of atheists. So the term atheist is quite elastic and doesn't necessarily mean what I thought it meant. Yes. And so your point about actually discovering from the individual what they actually believe rather than me saying, oh, they must be a Dawkins fan yes. is well taken because I may completely misinterpret, misunderstand uh, yes. my expectations may be completely wrong. And that interpretation mm -hmm. will be done because we're seeing them through the lenses of our drama, yes. not what the reality is. And we need to get people to make a distinction between the two. I'll give you a story about myself. Yeah? I had a debate with Professor Ken James long time ago, right? Professor Ken James is a Nietzschean philosopher. He actually became a professor without writing a book. And as you know, in England, it's not like America, you got a PhD, you teach and you're a professor. You have to actually write a book. You have, have to have a lot of experience, yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, uh, belittling the, uh, the North American academia here, but you know, us Brits, you know. Yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, he didn't write a book, but he became a professor. That's how good he is, right? And I had a debate with him on God's existence. And, you know, at that time I was putting a deductive argument down and saying this is like hot and all of that stuff. And 
And then he was responding to me, and then at the end, when I think it was the debate was finishing, he just sat with me and he was like, you know, from what I remember, he said, Hamza, I just want to know your values. Huh. What's this deductive stuff? He said, I'm an atheist, not because of this stuff. I'm an atheist because I don't know why my, I have to take care of my 18-year-old son, and for the past 18 years, he's been disabled. Mm -hmm. And that really got me, you know. I was like, I've, I've missed the human in the yeah. discussion. Now, because we had a very positive engagement, fast forward a few years, in my mid-30s, I wanted to go back into academia. So I, did a, I applied for a postgraduate certificate in philosophy. And the only way I could get in was with his no. discretion. <laughs> he let me in. So I finished the PG cert, then I did the MA, and then I did the MRes, and I'm a PhD student. But I think when I finished the MA, I wanted to thank him. Do you know what he said to me? He said to me, let's have lunch. I want to know your story. Now that, like, you know, with me, one of my weaknesses is if, he, if, if I have a fear of being misunderstood, yeah? And him saying, I want to know your story, I'm like, oh my God, I love you, <laughs> yeah? Because, like, he wants to know me. So we went to have lunch, and he said, basically, we're not going to have our own meal. We're going to share a meal. So we've got a few places, and we cut it together. We're talking about an atheist, right, professor. But it was such an amazing engagement. And my conversation with him was, I actually told him about why Allah is worthy of worship in such a natural, organic way. He wanted to know about our values. Mm -hmm. And that conversation was far more productive than the debate. Mm -hmm. Because in the debate, I didn't engage with the person. And don't get me wrong, the debate maybe had its own objectives from a social perspective, but from an individual perspective, I lost him. But when we had this dinner conversation, it was a very profound, moving experience. To the end, when I walked him back to the office or something, he, he gave me a hug, right? Um, and that, for me, te taught me a lot, which is, you know, yes, there are times for debates and discussions, and even when you have debates and discussions, you know, when Allah says in the Qur'an, call to the way of your Lord with hikmah, wisdom, and beautiful preaching, and debate with them in ways that are best. Jamakhshari, the famous grammarian, he basically said, this means without any harshness or gruffness, gruff, gruffness, right? And interestingly, there are, there are exegetes that say, well, because God says, call to the way of your Lord with, with hikmah, wisdom and beautiful preaching, and then God says, wa jadilhum, and debate them in ways that are best. The wow is like a linguistic barrier uh, and grammatically, when you analyze the verse, you see that the default position is to use wisdom and beautiful preaching. And the debating is instrumental. It's for particular ends. And you have to do it in a particular way with, with certain variables in place. But what we do in the Dawah, unfortunately, we, we, we turn the verse the other way around. We make debating and you know, being assertive and trying to like impose and win an argument, the primary thing. But Allah is telling us the primary thing is actually wisdom and beautiful preaching. And this revival of wisdom is so important, Paul, because Allah says in the Quran, and we taught him wise judgment and ilm and knowledge. And this is how we, we reward the doers of good. So God is making a distinction between wise judgment and knowledge. And he's linking it to virtue. These are the people of doers of good, the people of Ihsan. And we need to revive wisdom. And as Ibn Qayyim said, the 14th century theologian, that wisdom is to say the right thing at the right time in the kind of right way. So you may have abstract knowledge of what's the right thing to do, but do you have the ability to apply it in that particular context? You have to say in the right way, uh, in saying the right thing in the right time, right? So context is so important. Understanding the variables is so important. We think sometimes we have this kind of like binary thinking about how to treat all human beings. And this is not of the son of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way he related, he would create. So if, even if there was an enemy, or even if there was someone who hated him and wanted to kill him, his linguistic utterances and his way of being, his behavior was such that he would get the optimal version of that person. And we gave the examples previously about the man who asked for money back and the man who wanted to kill him. The way he expressed himself and the way he related from his behavior was an optimal way. And assuming that there is an optimal version of that person and the way I relate to that person, I'm going to get the optimal person from that engagement. And a lot of this, Paul, at the end of the day, requires experience and it requires you to be to stand in the possibility that maybe my heart is not in the right state when I 
talk to people uh, yeah, and engage with people. Of as well, it involves learning skills, uh, verbal emotional skills, emotional intelligence, yeah. emotional intelligence, a certain disposition. It's not something that just can be switched on or switched off. It's it's a, a level yeah. of maturity and a level of uh, experience, uh, as you say. And uh, so, how how does one acquire that? I mean, in in your work with the uh, the Sapiens Institute, presumably you run courses and you yes. teach you teach this. Yeah. So we have a learning platform that's free, mm -hmm. and we have an advanced doubt training course. We have the No Doubt course on there as well. We have thousands of students, it's all free. And in the advanced doubt training course, we go through this. It's like the 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 way of being of the du'at of people who share Islam. In actual fact, we're actually developing a more advanced course. Uh, Dr. Smail Latif is developing it on how leadership in Dawah and, and who you must become in the Dawah with case studies. So we teach them how to unpack the different variables and how you must become accordingly, right? And so we train people on, on how they must approach people. So we talk about compassion, we talk about when to be positively assertive, we talk about being sincere, not having ego, we're talking about um, you know, listening with the intention to understand, seeing the individual, the person, having being committed to their goodness and their guidance. So all of this stuff that we actually cover. And I truly believe if you at least have it in the forefront of your mind and heart and you engage with people in that way, then you will see changes in your dawah over time. Right. And look, no one's going to be perfect, yeah? If you want to even look at my kind of uh, dawah history, no way, you know, I've made many mistakes. But the whole point is of people like me is to show you don't repeat the same mistakes. Mm -hmm. And so uh, uh, we, need, we need to revive this because at the moment, because of social media, because of a sense of, I don't know, kind of binary ideological thinking, if you like, you know, there's no greys, um, we become excessive sometimes we're excessively soft and excessively harsh there's no middle way right so i think i've also noticed that uh, um we were discussing this earlier before we started recording that in my experience dawah tends to be overwhelmingly male uh and, and younger male as well and and women for some reason are not uh there in any strong numbers but you said at universities is a bit different is that right yeah i mean from my experience sisters at universities when they're involved in an isoc and islamic society mm -hmm. and they have like a sister dawa booth their conversations are far more profound usually why is that i think because they're more agreeable and i would even say that even men who are more agreeable mm -hmm. they have better dawa conversations because they're more likely to seek the context they're more likely to understand the person Look, everyone's different, so we can't make everyone the same, but we should at least stand in the possibility that I have certain skills that are good for the Tao, and I may have other certain skills or certain features of my personality that are not good for the Tao, and I need to be on a path of self-improvement. Mm -hmm. We need to stand in that possibility. So, you know, when it comes to females or sisters, generally speaking, they're more agreeable. And when you're more agreeable, you're going to have a better conversation. Yeah, and then people uh, as they don't, don't want to be battered over the head with arguments. They want to be you know, treated uh, holistically. Yeah, of course. And you want to plant the seeds. You want to find out, as we said in the beginning, how do I uncloud this person's fitrah? How do I uncloud the... Because asking that question is important because you can't just assume it's an abstract rational argument. It doesn't work for everybody. And we see this, how the companions became Muslim, how Muslims today become Muslim. It's not purely by abstract reasoning. But, and it could be a combination of different things. So when you're agreeable, you're, you're more likely to think, right, how can I engage with this person in the most optimal way? How can I find out how to uncloud their fitra? Maybe they don't want an argument. They want a pizza, right? Or they want to talk about ethics. You don't know. Allah knows. But at least you should be in the position and stand in the possibility that that could be the case, that there's more than one way of unclouding this person's fitrah. And you, if you're really committed to their well-being and their goodness and their guidance, then you should actually seek ways of unclouding the fitrah. And when you're agreeable, you're more likely to do that. Mm. That's a fascinating and refreshing uh, approach to, to Dawa. Um, and what, I mean, what role does apologetics play in that though? I mean, the hard arguments for the existence of God, for example, yeah. for someone who is having serious doubts I, I mean presumably they still have a absolutely oh it's a very good question that you raise actually because it sounds like we're just like advocating you know uh, a fluffy type of dawah here yeah? no we're advocating holistic dawah which means bring everything together according to the sunnah and yes many occasions you need to have strong arguments many occasions but if you just solely rely on that approach then you're going to lose maybe 75 percent of the population right that's the problem and what i would say is when you understand this model, then you may realize, in actual fact, I'm going to use some rational arguments here. I'm going to combine it with 
uh, being forbearing and compassionate and, and, and repelling that person or responding to that person with goodness and, and with well-being and with virtue and beauty. And I'm going to combine it with, I don't know, another approach, like giving them some spiritual stuff, like something from the Quran, why God is worthy of worship, because I think they need that too. And those three could be even more effective than just relying on an abstract argument. In some cases, all you need may be the apologetic argument in some cases, but in many cases, you need a combination of different approaches. And that's what we need to start to develop. And because when you see certain conversations, you know, for example, there was a, an apostate um, athe uh, Pakistani atheist that came up to me, I think uh, it was one of the university lectures, and he said, Hamza, you know, your argument for God's existence doesn't make sense because causality doesn't make sense outside of the universe. Now, I could have given him a Kantian example to show that causality is not just derived from experience, it's a priori, you need it to understand your experiences, but nice. what, why, like yeah. Reasons, yeah. So, yeah. why would I do that? Why would I do that? I was like, well, let me engage, let me try and find out what's going on with this person. And, you know, all, all, from experiences, you get certain hunches. So I mm -hmm. said to him, I said to him, what do you mean by causality? Because obviously in the Western metaphysical tradition, the nature of the causal link, there's a lot of disagreement, right? Not that cause and effect exist, but rather the, the nature of the causal link. Anyone studying you know, a basic metaphysics class would realize there's a lot going on there, right? Um, and to cut a long story short, he said, I don't know. And then I realized something. I said, hold on a second. You don't know what causality means, and you've used it as a key word in a sentence to deny God. So I changed my approach. I was far more, I think, engaging. We sat down and through the conversation, do you know what we con he concluded? He said, look, basically, I didn't know how to connect to God because I came from a secular background. That was his main problem, you see. So it came with a kind of rational argument to hide yeah. the kind of psycho-emotive stuff that was happening. And by the way, Paul, you know, we have a thing called Lighthouse Mentoring Service where we give you one, free one-hour sessions on doubts and mentoring in the Tao and so on and so forth. And I would say roughly around 75% of the cases that come across as intellectual, when you have this dynamic conversation, being committed to their well-being, you realize that it wasn't intellectual in the first place. It's a presenting issue that they come to you with, but in fact behind that, that oh, whole, yes. whole Now I'm not saying, you know, uh, they're all emotional, but human beings are like that. Like even in modern cognitive science, they come, they're coming to the agreement that man is not purely rational. Well, look, we find there's a lot of atheists, and this has been uh, noted by, in social psychology, a lot of atheists are very angry with God, which is completely nonsensical. Yes, angry, of course. They don't believe in. Yep. But of course they are, and, and it could be for a, a, a profound disappointment in life, and yep. grievance and so on. And they, they take out the, the ultimate revenge, the ultimate way of, of uh, nullifying what one's angry with is to deny his existence. It doesn't, you, Interesting. But that's a psychological move. It's not a, a, a philosophical point. It, it, it's yeah, so this is called, this is called mesotheism, right? The hatred of God. There's a book called, um, I think it's called Mesotheism, the, the untold story of the hatred of God or something like that. It's published by, published by Cambridge. And he, what the professor does or the academic does, he collects European literatures and he makes the argument that they didn't really reject his existence per se, mm -hmm. they just didn't like him because they were motivated primarily by humanistic impulses. Yes. Which is very interesting because, you know, in the 18th, 19th century, 20th century, lots of blood, right? There's lots of famine, lots of issues going on, disease and so on and so forth. And since they were motivated by humanistic impulses, they got somehow lost in that. And I argue, and I argue this in my book, they became egocentric, which is a cognitive bias that their way of seeing things is the only way. So they may have started with a good impulse, but it, 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 it took them down the route of egocentrism that God must see things the way I see things. Yeah, But we know Allah has the picture, we just have the pixel. So miso theism, the hatred of God is actually a thing. Yes. Yeah, and that's why sometimes when you ask atheists, um, Okay, if God did exist, would you worship him? Some of them say no. And that's the issue. You say, okay, well, why? What's going on here? The leading, the, the three uh, leading American atheist philosophers who are on record, I forget their names, I, I wouldn't have any problem mentioning because they've stated this on record, that they don't want God to exist. They, 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 there's a personal disinclination from wanting to exist because they have their own personal agendas, their own reasons in their life. Yes. So this is not a, a, a disinterested uh, quest for truth. This is a personal 
dis disinclination to want to believe God yes, exists. Yes. They don't want him to believe. Therefore, they choose to be atheists. And this is a fascinating motivation because you're kind of creating your own metaphysics from your own desires, Absolutely. which of course is the wrong way around. You, <clears throat> we should look to the truth rather than our own desires for guidance. But therefore, that would also mean that the way you approach these people is not just abstract yeah. rational arguments. Maybe there's something concerning what we would call in the Islamic tradition, the spiritual heart. They may have a bit of uh, kibber, arrogance that we need to deal with in an appropriate way. And the Quran has many verses on how to to deal with that human condition. Funny, when I first went to, uh, as a Muslim speaker's corner, uh, um, having reading the Quran, is how many of the, the types, the psychological, psychological types, the mentalities that you read about in the Quran, I was actually seeing at Speaker's Corner, so, uh, uh, it was extraordinary, particularly the atheist mentality, the, as you say, the arrogance and so on, the mocking mm. attitude, and the Quran mentions this many times. So it was almost like the Quran was a psychology textbook to, to help to read people as you were meeting them. Well, they, they, one uh, student of knowledge said, you don't read the Quran, the Quran reads you. Yeah, and you see yourself in the Quran. And what's interesting, which is a bit of a side note, that you know, people who hate on Islam, usually they're just reading themselves in, in the Quran. Exactly. And you know, Allah says in, in the third chapter, verse seven, about the ambiguous and unambiguous verses. And you know, the unambiguous verses are the, like the foundation of the book, the mother of the book. But the ambiguous verses, people who have a sickness in their heart, they were trying to interpret in a different way. So they're seeing themselves in the verses in a way, right? Yeah, and that's what happens. Sometimes you, you see yourself in the book. And that's why it's quite funny. I think the Daily Mail, the right wing newspaper, um, reported that one of the far right um, spokespeople or leaders or people used to shout a lot about the press or that he was quoting him. I don't know what I mentioned. It was very bad describing him in a really bad way. He was actually caught and put in prison for doing the thing that he was accusing the Prophet of doing. So he read himself in the Islamic discourse because his heart was such and he, pro yeah. it was a, the, the, his reading of the Quran was a projection of himself. Yes. Yeah. So that's an interesting, interesting uh, insight. But yeah, so I mean, I mean, in summary, we just have to be more psycho spiritually aware and understand the human being as the human being is because Allah created the human being. And Allah knows the human being better than the human being. So we can't assume the human being is like an, is like an AI machine that you type in an algorithm, algorithm, you expect different results. The human being is a dynamic interplay of the fitra, the nafs, the ruh, the qalb, and so on and so forth, and the aql, which is a function of the qalb, and the qalb, the taqallub, it wavers and it could be diseased. So we have to appreciate that. So that really becomes a lot about psychology, a lot about how can I relate with this person and the best way to emulate in that is the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and we've mentioned a few things with regards to that. If people want to uh, discover more of your work and the uh, Sapiens Institute, you have a, a website? Yeah, they just go to sapiensinstitute.org. Uh, there's a link that goes to a learning platform, engage with it, give us uh, critical feedback as well, constructive feedback, right. and we're gonna, always going to be improving our courses, inshallah. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much indeed. No, uh, thank you for your time. It's a pleasure meeting you as always. Until yeah. next time. Jazakallah. Take care. Assalamu alaikum.